So let's start with the people. So, um, you want me to start with this? Yeah. So, so guys, this will be around. So we'll use not the, the photo technique, but these two figures. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the about the discussions and science. So we were so we uh, we were looking around the assignment and the discussion. I have to be honest, at least at least my start what is your case, Robert, in your case, it's the first time that I use this tool. Which tool? Discussion. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. So we are we are still learning about the tool. And I have we have we have one suggestion for all of you. When you when you try a discussion, I suggest you to include uh like a, a clear title in your discussions. So don't put the word discussion, it's discussion. Because that is very difficult to start organizing the, the your ideas. So you're asking about I don't know the the cultural uh, I call it the, the competency of the competency of the of the planning projects in India. Do something like that in the title, so that helps us understand. How do you like with Trevor? That could be. That's gonna be good. That could be a good option. So put put in the title something that explains where you're thinking about. So that helps us to have different layers of discussion. So so and and that will help your friends to see what are you thinking about. And to see what is the best uh, uh, alternative that they want to respond. And the second thing that we have decided not this week or starting next week is to have a new rule for creation. So if, if you look at bright space, so it's uh, sorry, if you look at the syllabus, it says clearly that you have to pause this discussion before the 9 a.m. And the reason is really simple is because we want you to be preferred. One hour in advance of the class, you have time to come here or to come or to or to take a shower to come here. But at nine o'clock, you are already there. A jury have in your minds your idea for the class. So we noticed that some of you were posting questions after nine o'clock, or actually sometimes during the class or after the class, which is it's better than not posting the question, but it's not completely good because you're not prepared to discuss or to understand and to engage with the class. So for that reason, we have decided to have a new rule for grading. So, so uh, and the, the rule is basically one, two, one, four, really simple. So this is if you pass the question before 9 a.m. This is you pass in the same day. And again, this is if you pass the question after 9 a.m. And again, this is if you pass the question the day after. Or not, or not. And this is so you will have two points for your questions plus the form and, and the same rate for the response to other I want to know if this is clear. Is it clear? Okay, if you pass the question before 9 a.m., you have two points. If you have passed the question after 9 a.m., you have one. And if you have you have to pass the question the day after, you have no, no points. Yeah. Of the day of the discussion. Of the lecture. Of the day of the lecture. Thursday. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ali, yeah. Alim has a question. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes. So on Thursday, you have to be prepared for this lecture, uh, reading the, uh, making the readings, doing the readings, and making a comment, and doing a comment in the discussion that is in private. If you pass and you have to do a question, which is the point out of the point, and you have to respond to the question of other this whole part of the point, which is total. So the way what we are grading is if you pass the question and the response before 9 a.m. on Thursday, you have two points. If you have if you pass the question after 9 a.m., you will have one point. And if you have to pass the question one day after, so not today but Friday or later, it's great. But, but it will be zero points. Any questions so far? It's, it's really simple. And, and sorry, sorry? Uh, no, before 9 a.m. Because class is 10. Oh, it's, it's not before class, it's before 9 a.m. So it's one hour before. Yeah. Uh, so if you pause the question at 9.55, 
or 901, it will be. Uh, and, and basically, we are reading the. So if when you. So here, so the bright scale of the line. When you are used to the, the bright space line. Uh, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So any, any, any questions so far about that? Okay. So being said that, we have, we have a very interesting discussion today because we. So, and. There are two reasons because I love this discussion of today, Robert. One is because we are always looking at precedents in architecture. Yeah. Every night you look at precedents. Every single studio lab you look at precedents. So we will discuss it as from the perspective of the by guy to put a precedent to, to, to receive a precedent, how we how we receive that, how we can apply that, how we can translate precedent from one concept to the other, and how that in could involve certain topics like colonization or adaptation or translation. We will discuss it that. How in your project you can post a, a question. Sorry, you, you can sorry, you can you can uh, uh, export or not ideas from even for one country to the other. This is the main topic for today. So um, Robert, how do you want to address the question? If you are very good listening and writing, or are you prepared to read that? No. Um... I think that this is great that you did all this work. And uh, my wife always says, why can't you give me the answer in 10 words or less? And my response is, well, in order to figure out how you say it in 10 words or less, I have to write it wrong because writing is our way of thinking. So you've done a lot of thinking. Look how long Connor's thoughtful uh, uh, thread, launching of this thread is. But we don't have time for that, right? We don't have time for that. So just shout out what, and remember, this is, this is your attempt to extract value out of the next hour and 45 minutes. How are you going to explain to your parents how you spent all their hard-earned money and this chunk of the best four years, four or five years of your life? What are you going to get out of it? This is your chance to ask a question, challenge us to fulfill your needs to know. You tell us what you need to know. What's, what's on your mind based on all of this thinking and reading and writing? What do you need to know from us? Challenge us. What are your questions? No question? Yes. Uh, what strategies can cities implement their value into the capital of the market marketplace? Great. You're still repeating the same. In a new way. way. It's great. It's similar that we that we discussed or you asked last week. It's very well put. Yeah. Who else? Is it? I'm tired, but I think we can do that. Or we can start down the road, but we don't know. And that's all you need to know? How much does this course cost? I don't know. A lot. How are you going to get your money squared? What are you going to, what do you need to know? Yeah. Well, I was just kind of curious. Uh, in the article that you showed up, I, I know you talked about the working in job of the work. Um, did you like, participate in the westernization or did you try to stop that? This is personal. Um, we don't have an answer. Class. Class. Okay, what else do you need to know? I can't answer that. <laughs> That's it. That's all you need to know. You'll be satisfied with your time and effort. Phew, we got up, we're getting up easy. Yeah, actually we came 
So something that we can do, we can respond to this question and stay here silent for the rest of it. And they'll come up with more questions. Yes. Are mega projects like the ones uh, that you can send also like the time, they unavoidable because of like the economic implications from uh, that'll benefit the government uh, with the architects are there alternatives to the mega project? I have one issue that I think we'll have a possible response to that question next week. So please remember to ask the delegate. Yeah, all of these questions uh, are going to lead to other questions. So, yeah, uh, just the way Sean's question. Don't, don't let us off the hook. That's it? Oh. Uh, where is the line drawn between the architect implementing uh, something that is like scientifically right between the architect implementing their own? So, do you remember when we'll talk about participatory planning? Yeah, when, next we, week? when are we going to do that? Since next week or the only. So, please, okay, from so we just see participatory planning in the syllabus. Remember to come with that question again. Get right today. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that my capturing then? Sometimes designers have an aesthetic preference or this is what I like versus something that is based in some rational foundational understanding of how to maximize the benefits for the most people. Yeah, actually there is when, when Rafael Moneo, you know who is Rafael Moneo? It's a great Spanish architect. Uh, when he received the gold, the gold medal for the Rita in Europe, he he wrote a letter that you can find in mind called Needs an Arbitrary in well, It's a good one. He said that we are always having this uh, tension between the thing that the project needs and the, and the, and the arbitrary idea that comes into our mind. And he have an argument that sometimes they, they overlap. So I suggest you to, uh, to look at that later. If they have that, they, he, he's rough on it. They have, have some. And maybe share it on the WhatsApp group. Fine. Okay, yeah. Because we're all interested. I didn't know. Any other questions? And during the lecture, you can ask questions too. Okay. Um, there's a sign up sheet for attendance that should go around because some people came in late. Maybe. Send it around again. I'm going to click there. I'm going to click here. I'm going to click here. Okay. I'm going to try to finish before 11. So the basic premise of this lecture is something I've, I've mentioned previously. And that is when, when, when the 11 billion, remember PQ? And if your laptop is open, I hope you're taking notes and not uh, working on studio. Um, when, do we, when we reach PQ at 11 billion humans, around the year 2100. What is the world? If you ask almost anyone, they will be optimistic uh, to a certain extent, at least about their own lives. They will say, uh, uh, even though I live in a, a self-produced home in uh, Dharavi, Mumbai, India, even though I live in uh, 
plywood box that I had to make myself I, when I was in poverty, I know with, with great confidence that uh, when I'm a success, I will live in a house like the ones I see on TV. And those houses I see on TV are probably in the United States. And they're probably a lot like the houses produced by the Southern California real estate group. Uh, and I'll drive a car, and uh, there's a whole American culture. The pull of American culture all over the world is unprecedented. Um, maybe the Japanese or the Romans at a certain time, they had certain cultural sway, but nothing has ever matched the cultural attractiveness of the United States. And these lifestyle, these images of the U.S. lifestyle are broadcast every day, all day long, around the world through the images we now get on those screens in our pockets. Uh, and it's very romanticized. Uh, it doesn't include gun death. So, well, I guess gun death is part of the movie industry. But it doesn't include a lot of the problems that we have in the United States. There's a lot of rational, scientific uh, understandings of how do we meet the needs of the majority of humans? It's very, there's very clear scientific evidence that the United States is really bad at meeting the needs of people. We have the most expensive healthcare system by far. It is more expensive to treat almost any disease in the United States than any place on the planet. And the outcomes, if measured by child mortality, are pathetic. It's embarrassing. We have the most expensive and the lowest performing healthcare system in the world, if you look at the ratio. If you want to look at places that do it better, look at European countries that have systems in place to control costs and increase the quality of outcomes. Uh, housing, same thing. Transportation costs are insane in the United States and other cities and other places in the world. They have viable mass transit systems that make it so owning a car is optional, which greatly reduces the costs of getting around, which leaves you more money uh, for doing other things. So uh, even though the United States is the highest performing economy in the world, it's been booming since COVID, it's been growing faster than any other country in the world, which we never thought was going to happen. We thought India and China were the ones who were going to just keep booming economically, while uh, Japan, the U.S., and Western Europe creep up steadily. But that those we had to rethink that because the U.S. is just booming. However, it's not just. Uh, measures in dollars and cents, what's the per capita gross domestic product per person in the United States, is how much does that buy? And if you take those two things together, uh, then we've got some work to do. But in the last few moments, when the United States has some cultural credibility uh, left to its name, when the world is looking to the United States, when they're envisioning the future, they think the United States. The United States is still providing the blueprint, the building blocks for other people's idea of what the future will be. And in those last few moments, we have, and we the architects especially, have the opportunity to present possibilities, arrangements of our cities uh, the relationship between income, housing, health, transportation, land use, uh, businesses, all of these arrangements, uh, we have the opportunity to present a more effective, a scientifically, demonstrably better, higher performing set of arrangements in our cities uh, than we have in the past. And uh, so it doesn't just matter that we get it right for ourselves. It matters that we get it right for the rest of the world. Right now, we're 4% of the human population contributing 25% of the carbon to 
to the opposite. It's not, it, that's a bad performance ratio. If we can become 3% uh, of the world population contributing 1% of global uh, carbon emissions, that's a model worth emulating with export. So this is the challenge of architecture in this generation. So we're gonna look at, a, we're trying to figure this out. We're gonna look at four examples, three negative examples and one positive example. Let's see, it's over there. So let's go to the site of the, one of the readings um, is Jakarta, Indonesia. Jakarta, Indonesia grew very fast after independence and uh, they faced a moment of truth in the 1970s when they were looking at uh, they were looking at different development models uh, they were doing a planning study and the Dutch government uh, offered some support. The Dutch famously uh, colonized Indonesia for three and a half centuries uh, in order to say, sorry about that, let us help you. They sent a team of architects and planners to Jakarta and said, let's look at the different possible models for development. And uh, And so they said, well, let's look at just kind of urban sprawl. If you just let things happen the way they happen, uh, it's gonna be very expensive to provide infrastructure. It's gonna result in traffic jams and it's not gonna be good. The second paradigm they looked at was maybe we can limit development to corridors, fingers away from the Northern coast, heading into the hills uh, just south of Jakarta. And if we can control the development in these fingers, that would be better. But uh, along the same logical lines, the Netherlands, which has a remarkable mass transit system, it has trains, you bicycle to the train station, you take the train to any city in the Netherlands, and then you bicycle from that train station with the second bike, and you can get pretty much anywhere you need to go without ever getting in the car. They have cars because they like to go on vacation in the north, but they don't need the cars. So uh, the Dutch model said, well, the coastal area is very sensitive mangrove forests. You need it to maintain coastal defense system and the watershed to the south and the hills, you need to, uh, you need to protect your water supply. So the best thing to do is to supply road and rail and water and sanitation infrastructure along a east-west corridor and maybe one to the, the hill town of Bogor to the south and just really limit the infrastructure to these two narrow things and you'll do much better. And so this became the preferred model for the development uh, of cities around Jakarta, this network of cities. But something happened. And this is kind of the story of the three negative examples. What happened is the president of Indonesia, who was a corrupt army general, his family was in the business of constructing freeways. And all of his friends were in the banking industry and they had this great idea. They look around the world, especially at the United States, and they see how much land value matters to the US economy. And if you, uh, go back to in the 1970s, how much does a hectare of land cost in Indonesia uh, around Jakarta? It's very, very, very cheap. It's crazy cheap. And what they did is they invented the real estate industry. If they can take a hectare that costs the equivalent of $1 and they can raise the value to $10 per hectare, they've just uh, created money. And if they can raise it to $100 per hectare, they've created a lot of money. And what they basically did is they created, they, uh, they create, they spot and sold land in, in what was the new land, the real estate land market of Indonesia. And they converted all of these $1 hectares of land 
into a hundred dollar and thousand dollar hectares of land. And once and once you create that value on paper, you can then mobilize bank loans. So this is kind of a crazy thing from an architect's point of view. What does this have to do with houses? Well, the houses became the mechanism by which the land around Jakarta became a source of incredible wealth. And so instead of the first model, the Dutch model of infrastructure provision, they basically used the US interstate highway system model where they uh, planned and built ring roads around Jakarta and filled this landscape that was farmland with houses. And uh, the houses they designed were based on trips they had made to Los Angeles, basically, to Southern California, to Orange County uh, in Southern California, where uh, there was this formula for real estate development that involved creating houses on plots of land in subdivisions in large developments in gated communities, and then costuming those houses in different uh, images. This one uh, is, there's the Arc de Triomphe. So this is French. Uh, this is Brunelleschi's dome. Their architects took the same architecture courses that we took in the United States. So they had access to the photos in the slide libraries of the Arc de Triomphe, uh, US architectural examples, uh, Brunelleschi's dome, remember 16, 1540. Uh, this is another one mixing. It's very confusing. Uh, this one mixes Greek Acropolis with Roman Colosseum. Um, and this is the marketing office. So if you read the article, uh, you got the idea that the idea was to uh, give people a sense of owning real estate uh, that was as good as anything in the rest of the world, even if it's really just a replica of California real estate uh, dressed up to look like these other places. No one lives in the Issei Shrine in Japan, um, but the gatehouse for this development, it's the same house behind here, it just has slightly different uh, details. And Photoshop was, in, was coming into vogue, so you collage the advertising and you put, um, wealthy white Americans in the advertising uh, with fancy cars. And when you, when you go to do the architectural drawings, it's more or less the same prop process as the advertising. So you just create buildings that are a collage of the different images you looked up. Um, I was out on a long bicycle ride one day. Uh, I stopped in this subdivision and I saw a few people there, so I stopped and interviewed them. And it turned out the guy I was talking to was not the owner of the house who lived in the house. He was the gardener of the house. And I said, uh, who lives here? And he said, what do you mean? I said, you know, are there people who lives here, who live here? And he says, every once in a while I spend the night. Basically, uh, he explained, I eventually got it out of him, that when a wealthy family has a child, they buy a house. And when they have a second child, they buy another house. Then they hire gardeners and house cleaners and security guards to spend the night uh, to keep it safe. But basically, this entire neighborhood is just an investment property, a set of investment properties. No one who owns these houses will ever live here. They won't even rent them out because that would just uh, de defeat the point. This is an investment property. No one will ever live here. And uh, when the, the child becomes of age and it's time for the wedding, they'll sell the house, pay for the wedding and set up the young couple with a nice house and a place where people do live, et cetera. So these are not houses produced to be lived in. Their houses as investment properties. And it turns out that every house has two sources of value. One is the use value and one is the exchange value. And if you don't remember anything about this lecture, 
except one thing. If you only remember one thing, it's this. Use value plus exchange value is the cost of the real estate. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I lived in a, a, a big house in the wealthy suburbs outside of New York City. And we did everything we did in the family room because the kitchen, the couch, the TV, the dining room table. But then there were all these other rooms. And I asked one day, why do we have this dining room? Why do we have this formal living room? What are they there for? My mom would do quilt projects in the extra space. It might as well have been the garage. And she said, well, the, the real estate agent said, that'll be good for when you go to sell the house. So my house growing up had one part of it for use value and one part of it for exchange value. It was all about uh, maximizing the wealth of the family by the house. Many of us are here in college because of the wealth produced by our parents' investments in houses. The number one source of wealth accumulation for most families in the United States is the value of the home. And we'll talk about uh, this, uh, I think next week when it comes to race in America, that um, those opportunities to build value uh, in the purchase and sale of homes is racially distributed. Some families have access to that wealth. Some families do not have access to that wealth. And so that's the, the topic of the next conversation. But the key thing is, the thing that matters here in these developments is the use value is trivial in comparison. And in this case, zero use value. No one lives here. And exchange value is the dominant factor in the production of housing in increasingly in many places. Is this built for this person or? It was built knowing that, sure, people could live here, but knowing that eh, either they live there or they don't live there, doesn't matter. What we need to do is to sell houses. And at a certain point, they start to design things knowing full well that no one will ever live there. That's interesting. Like, the design is good. It's good. No one is living there. The design has to be good enough so that uh, we can tell uh, a reliable story. 10 years from now, this house is going to be worth more than it's worth today. And if that story can be told with certain credibility, then it's a success. Um, this is a gated community, but just in case they, the, the people who, in order to sell the houses, they insisted on subdividing it just in case the exterior fortress walls of the gated community are breached, uh, they still have some protection inside. And in fact, in 1998, there were riots that, that caused problems. And you see this in skylines where there's skyscrapers and then golf courses with mansions. We, we would call them Mick mansions. And this is a cartoon replication of what uh, Los Angeles in particular, US cities generally, but Los Angeles in particular. The, the worst aspects of what we produced in the post-war is reproduced, but at a grand scale uh, in cities throughout the world. This is just one of them. And we talk about uh, the bundling of services. Uh, in the United States, when electricity uh, 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 we electrified, the U.S. government paid for the electrification of towns, no matter how much it cost, the government made sure uh, electrical service went to every town, no matter how far away it was. But when we get to the internet, uh, the internet infrastructure in the United States and the cell tower infrastructure of the United States was not uh, produced by the government, it was produced by private corporations. And so the, the, other, the other reading about splintering urbanism is all about 
if we can supply infrastructure, in this case, it's housing, recreation, shopping, if we can supply infrastructure just to wealthy people, even if the, those wealthy people are only 5% of the population, 5% of big countries like Indonesia, India, China, 5% of those populations is sometimes equal to or greater than the entire population of the United States. These are huge countries, 5% of these huge countries is a huge population to serve. So you can package the luxury goods. And this was uh, really the punchline of Ananya Roy's uh, reading last week is we need to figure out a way to give infrastructure to wealthy people and charge them for it while denying those infrastructures to poor people. In the United States, we do it through property taxes and school systems that are different from town to town. But in the rest of the world, they do it through private developments. And this is the bundling of services uh, favorably to, for wealthy enclaves, uh, residential enclaves and shopping uh, office and recreational enclaves. And then this is what Ram Kohlhaas would call junk space. It's the rest. So that's the main point of all of this, uh, this first topic of Indonesia. Um, it creates barriers to movement that didn't exist previously. It separates people from access to the places uh, they needed to go previously. Uh, I wrote that piece in 2002 and uh, 15 years later, uh, I don't know if they read it, but they took the title uh, Orange County, Java, and they basically created a, a community of that name. It was inevitable, I'm, I'm sure. So let's move to Shanghai. China was humiliated by the opium wars in the 1840s. When the British needed to drink tea, they needed to buy that tea from China, but China didn't have anything they needed to buy from the British. So the British didn't have any, any currency to purchase the tea in China. So they did what any of us would do. They grew opium in India and they got the Chinese population addicted to opium so that they could sell the opium to an addicted population in China and buy the tea to supply the demand in Britain, right? It's just business, no hard feelings. And that resulted in a Chinese retaliation, which became the, uh, the opportunity for the opium wars. The British Navy defeated China and took over. They'd never quite colonized China, but they took over Shanghai and divided it up amongst the European powers. So you have uh, this waterfront district, the Bund along the Huangpo River in Shanghai, which was quickly built up as an international center of trade operated by the French, the British, the U United States, and other foreign. Uh, and so the one of the most prolific opportunities for architects, for U.S. architects to build for many years in the 20s was along this uh, waterfront in Shanghai, China. This was a humiliating uh, piece of history for China, and it still hovers over them today. China needs to become a world superpower. And when you need to be a world superpower, you need to have a world-class city. And when you need a world-class city, who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters? Or are you gonna call the architects? You're gonna call the architects. So they say, we need a, we need to become a global city. Shanghai needs to become a global city. It's not enough for Tokyo, New York, and London. We need a fourth one, Shanghai. And so they called in the architects. They had a competition. And the architects do what we do. So, well, here's what Manhattan looks like. What if we just put a Manhattan there? Here's, uh, I, also have, uh, I also have a Venice, and I have something in your size uh, that is Paris. And so we take these models and we see if we can literally just lay them down on these rice fields. So the result of the competition is all these 
world famous architects from Europe and the United States uh, make these models. And the winner is the Shanghai team wins. And they take all of the submissions from the uh, other entrants and they combine them and they uh, just develop Pudong China, uh, some huge, huge proportion of the number of cranes in the world are located to Pudong, China, and they create basically uh, this high-rise city across the Huangpo River from old Shanghai. And, and uh, in the process, China discovered this thing where you can take land and create value. And so we always think that manuf the reason China is a booming economy is because they have cheap labor and and great manufacturing. But what gets neglected and what a lot of us have been researching and uh, finding evidence for is that yes, manufacturing iPhones are produced in China. There's a lot of uh, inexpensive manufacturing in China that is a source of great wealth. But as equal to or perhaps greater than that wealth generated by manufacturing, they took Again, farmland that might have been worth $1 per hectare, that then they created a real estate market, they built cities, and quickly it became worth $1,000 per hectare. And no one lives in some of these cities. This one is Thamestown built uh, to replicate uh, old, new, old London. Um, no one lives here, but it's a great place for wedding photography, it turns out. And you've heard about ghost cities, that these entire cities have been produced with highways and schools and sewer systems and water supply. And these cities are sitting there waiting for the people. There are no people living in these cities. And you may, have you heard of these ghost cities? Who's heard of ghost cities? Yeah. And, um, and so it makes for great YouTube watching. Um, and sometimes what you need to do in order to protect the value of these investments is you need to reduce the supply. Here's a case where some people did move in and they bought uh, dishwashers and uh, laundry equipment, but they don't have the income to pay the electricity bill so they do their laundry, their, the electricity is turned off and they do laundry in the local drainage canal. And, and when there's too much supply and not enough demand, uh, sometimes you have to uh, take extraordinary measures and uh, sometimes you have to actually reduce the supply. They built too much too quickly. The value of the real estate went down because of oversupply. So the logical thing to do because of exchange value, the financial indicators uh, made sure that these buildings that cost a lot of money to build, they had to destroy them in order to maintain the value of the rest. Question? There's, who's going to buy them? People can't afford to buy them. There's a mismatch between supply and demand. Uh, I'm a peasant farmer. Uh, you're telling me I need to move into the city, but I can't afford the real estate. Um, I'm not going to buy. Uh, I'm going to try to stay. I'm going to move in with my neighbors or something. Exactly. They made it cheaper, then they made it cheaper, then they made it cheaper. And pretty soon, their spreadsheet gives them the conclusion that they, their investment, all of a sudden, all their investment is actually not worth much. So they actually uh, get more money out of it if 
by boosting the value of what's left by destroying 40 something buildings that they had already built. Yes. Well, don't ever really. There are definitely cases where there'll be an earthquake and schools will collapse and children will die. That happened a few years ago. That's the case where the contractor says, here's how much it costs to build this school. And then says, uh, well, I can, I can steal some of that budget by putting less Portland cement in the concrete mix. And I can, the other, the, the most expensive thing is the rebar, it's the steel. And so I can save the expense of the steel by keeping the steel out of the building. So no one will find out until the next earthquake and I'll be long gone. So that does happen. I don't think that was the cause of this. The literature on this, it was really about the financial incentives uh, behind the production of the housing. So Dubai, we're, we have a, a global research studio next September that's gonna go to Dubai and they're gonna look at Dubai. Um, let's look at Dubai. And the question we ask, as we always do, is what, what up with that? What's going on in Dubai? Everyone knows Dubai is the tallest city in the world. There must be a lot of demand to live in Dubai. People must really need to live, and not just in Dubai, but they must need to live right at the center of Dubai because we studied the history of architecture. The land value in Chicago went up. Each, each lot in the center of Chicago was worth so much money that when steel and elevators and uh, terracotta facades, lightweight facades were invented, they could all of a sudden build 13, 18, 20 story skyscrapers in Chicago because the land was so valuable. Here in Boston, a lot of people don't drive to work because we have the green line that takes us from fancy suburbs uh, like Brookline and Newton, and we can take the green line into downtown or Park Street and then walk to these offices in the skyscrapers in downtown Boston. So we know in our bones why tall buildings exist. The reason tall buildings exist is because there's a lot of demand for office space and uh, luxury condos in the center of the city. And so the land is worth a lot. So it makes sense to spend the money it takes to build a tall building. And that we assume that that applies to Dubai, right? But I guess why we're even talking about it, because it doesn't. If you had $10 billion, and I hope you do, if you have $10 million, if you have $10,000, and I hope you do, you should not put all that investment income into the stock market. This is free financial advisor stuff here. You need to diversify. You've heard that word, right? Diversify your investments. So if the, typically when the stock market goes down, Stocks go down, bonds will go up, real estate might go up or down, but it's good to put like half in stocks, 60% in stocks because you're young, uh, and then split the rest, 20% in bonds and 20% in real estate. And uh, nation states have a huge amount of investment capital that are kept in things called sovereign wealth funds. And when you have a sovereign wealth fund, you owe it to your nation to invest wisely. So you're gonna put 20% of that in real estate. And it's easier to manage if the 20% investment in real estate is in a single building. That's why these buildings exist. It's the sovereign wealth funds of different uh, nation states needed to put 20% of their sovereign wealth fund and each building is a different sovereign wealth fund. The Emirates, had a really big sovereign wealth fund. So what do they do? We need a really big building.
But look at Dubai. How do we get around in Dubai? We drive. The police have Lamborghinis. Uh, we drive. So with all this emptiness, it's basically a desert everywhere. With all this emptiness and nothing in it, why is there so much demand to just build high? It's not the same as Boston or Chicago. It's driven by the investment pressure of sovereign wealth funds, and especially the really big sovereign wealth fund. So if people live in these buildings, we don't care. We don't need people to live in these buildings. We need people to buy parts of these buildings. They don't need to live in it. So these buildings are largely empty. As a matter of fact, when I took went with students to the Burj Khalifa, we went up this far because that was less expensive than the observation at the top. But this whole, from that point up, it's about as tall as the Hancock building in Boston, and it's empty. No one lives there, no one uses it, no one even owns it. It's just empty space that just that is there to make it the tallest building in the world. So remember uh, the story, it's use value plus exchange value. In this case, maybe there are some expats who have fancy jobs because they're financial services uh, corporation located here. And so they rent apartments for subsidized rates that are disconnected from the exchange value. So there are rental units available. You can go there, you can work as an architect, you can make a lot of money, and you can rent a pretty cheap place. It's disconnected from the actual sale value of the apartment that you live in. And, uh, and this building is there to signal uh, the value of Dubai itself. And this is not just true in Indonesia, in China, and in Dubai. Uh, you'll see when you uh, leave the building, and you'll see one Dalton place in Boston. And uh, next fall, when uh, we go on daylight savings, you should look at one Dalton place and ask the question, does anybody live there? So around 6, 7 p.m., you'd expect people to be getting home from work and making dinner. You expect to see some lights on, and there are some lights on, but it's not like other buildings. It's largely dark. And so researchers, architectural researchers, have been looking at the utility bills of the tallest buildings in London, New York, uh, elsewhere, and finding that it's, that it's pretty empty. Yeah, so I, I read the news, I tried to find the news that in, in, in Manhattan, currently, there are a lot of uh, very, very tall skyscrapers north uh, Central Central Park. Yeah, and the 57th I'm, Street yeah, above, the Upper East Side. Yeah, Bloomberg. Owned by, owned by, made by Russian and Chinese developers. Right, they purchase through shell corporations, so they don't have to identify who owns it. And then, and basically, as I did, but the question is, this is they basically buy that and they, are, they have no intention to live in it, to live it there, and, and to and to sell that, and basically to uh, speculate with the land and do all their money. Right, okay. it's a place to park their money in a dependable investment. So, yeah. So, do so you think that is probably that the world understood the how capitalism work because doing the same can be in America now? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Last year. One out of every four home sales, 25% of the homes sold in the United States were bought by investment firms, investment corporations. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and in the case of New York and in Manhattan, so you know Boris, I have a good friend who works in New, in New York Times uh, as a journalist. It, I, you cannot imagine a better position, but you right. cannot afford a house in Manhattan. Right. You have to live in Brooklyn or in Queens and commute three, three hours per day, one and a half uh, in the morning, one and a half in the afternoon. 
and while the city is having empty houses. That is the condition. Right. That is the condition. We have no houses for people to live, but at the same time, uh, you have houses that are empty. And uh, one of the ways we maintain the value of real estate is we perform spectacles. One of the reasons New York City is New York City is the ball at Times Square on New Year's Eve. The ball drops and we reinforce the message. Times Square is the crossroads of the world. New York is the most important city in the world. Here's the evidence. New Year's Eve, everybody watches the ball drop. Well, in order to protect the investment value of all of Dubai, they need to make a spectacle of the tallest building in Dubai because the higher the value of the most expensive property, the higher the value of all property. That is true in Dubai. That is true in New York. That is true in Boston. How many of you live off campus, but not in your parents' house? How do you feel about your rent? Ooh. Did your rent go up last year? Did the apartment get better? What happened that caused your rent to go up? So I went to a fancy school and I took a real estate economics course. And at this fancy school, they drew a, a map of cities. And so this is the center of the city, downtown crossing. And this is uh, out of the Lundster, Lundster, you know, this is the far away from the center of the city. When the value of Dalt, one Dalton place goes up, it pulls, it pulls the value of Mission Hill apartments. And the more expensive the apartments get at one Dalton place, the more investment I can park there. So it's good for me as a Saudi oil sheep to park my money in something really expensive. And so I might ask, I'm sorry, I actually need to buy a $15 million apartment. I have $15 million to park. I'm not interested in the $12 million apartment. And the real estate broker says, well, I'm willing to sell it to you that $12 million apartment for $15 million. And so, oh, perfect, thank you. So now the value of that apartment as determined by the market is now $15 million. What's the value of your apartment on Mission Hill? It's higher than it was because of this curve. Sorry about that. And how many of you live in a Wentworth dorm? Does the Wentworth dorm, do they charge what they charge because that's what it costs? No, what do they charge? Why do they charge what they, how do they set the prices of a warrant with dorm? Probably a made up equation. It's a very simple equation. Well, that's why you value it. What we learned during COVID is that the viability, the financial viability of Wentworth depends to a very large extent on the housing we sell to students, the housing we rent out to students. And when your survival as an institution depends not just on tuition, but also on the housing costs, you tell your faculty, you're not allowed to teach online. You have to teach in person, even if the statistics say you're, that it's dangerous. The other thing that it does is it tells, you know, the financial planners of Wentworth, they, when they say, how much should the, uh, the housing cost of Wentworth? What's the answer? It's a simple answer. How much should the housing at Wentworth cost? As much as we can possibly get. If the market if the competition price goes up, what does Wentworth do with its cost? It mm -hmm. follows it exactly, maybe a little more. So there's a lot of financial equations that go into calculating the exchange value of 
housing and property. And this has a lot to do with increasingly more and more, this is what architects do. We produce, the reason they call the architects is because we produce exchange value by replicating the most expensive things. Um, there's two videos here that might be interesting for you to watch just about how, ex how extreme is wealth discrepancy now in the world and how does it get that way? It gets that way because of real estate uh, and other things. And so there's two short videos about that. Let's, end, uh, let's now move into the second half of our show where we start to look at positive things. Uh, the overarching theme is how do we do things in a, how do we provide positive models that could then get reproduced in other places? And uh, one of the very positive models that we produced, there were some negative models here that got reproduced in other places. But there's also some positive models that came out of architectural production and ideas about housing in the United States. In the 1930s and 40s, we were looking at a severe housing shortage. So the US government said, let's build public housing. Let's, let's build public housing to increase the supply of affordable housing for all Americans. That will depress the upward pressure on demand. So supply will be increased, demand uh, will bring down the cost of housing for everyone. And if we can supply high quality housing at a fixed rate that is attached to people's income, then we can solve multiple problems. We can do what Singapore did. We can reduce the housing costs for Americans so that they can uh, be a productive workforce. They can be happy. They can be in good quality housing next to good schools in good towns. And uh, it was a brilliant formula. But next week, we're going to talk about how uh, racism uh, in housing has caused uh, a lot of good ideas to go very badly. And this is one of them. But this was a model that was picked up in other countries. And so some of you, a few of you looked at the slides last week and picked this for an analysis. This is an example in Vienna, Austria, of this idea from the United States for public housing that was implemented extremely well in Vienna, Austria uh, to create very high quality housing at a very low cost. And the New York Times uh, publicized this example uh, a year ago, and it's a fantastic <clears throat> article. Maybe I can share it on the WhatsApp chat if you're interested of uh, of collectivized housing with a very high quality quite large at a very affordable rate this apartment i think uh the article said i think eight hundred dollars a month or six hundred dollars a month but it's it's quite large it comes with all of there's a pool uh there's a sauna there's uh, uh, facilities for children. It's quite good. Um, very high quality and it's working. And it's, it's working in places like Austria. It's working in places like Singapore. England has some of these. Uh, it's actually a model that's been proven to be quite viable. It's been largely abandoned in the United States, but it's making a comeback. If you look at what's happening in New York City, they are investing in uh, the quality of their public housing as a solution to the situation that Ignacio was referring to. So I think that's it uh, for now. So okay. we'll so, switch to you. So now I, I, I'm in charge to talk about a great positive model that was replicated in, in, in a different country. So and we, we, uh, I'm coming back to, to the relationship between Barcelona and Medellin. I know that we were talking about Barcelona and Medellin several times, 
and and basically because they are a great example. So uh, we have now almost less than an hour to discuss um, these options, and I I will try to do two things. One is to explain the models in detail because I believe that you can use some of these examples for for your projects here in, in Wentworth and beyond. And, but additionally to that, because there was the, the I, I want to talk a little bit about the theories behind Medellin and Barcelona and how these theories were adapted from one country, from one example to, to, to the other. So, so and, and in that case, I need your help because it's not easy to make these translations because they were uh, quite different. So during, so I will start with Barcelona, I will move towards Medellin. And what I want you to, to do is, 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 I want you to help me about what things Medellin took from Barcelona. So what are the big ideas that Medellin took from Barcelona? First of all, I have to say that this presentation comes from a lot of friendship. So this is myself discussing with some of the authors of these projects. So in, in, in the last years, I, so we were uh, building a great friendship with different guys. And I especially want to talk about this guy who is Cacho Echeverri. You know Cacho? Yeah. So I'm the one who suggested he come to Boston. Yeah, sorry? I suggested. OK, he came to Boston because so we forgot because of, of, of Robert. So Cato uh he's a very important guy here because he studied in Barcelona. And after he studied in Barcelona, and he was a professor in Barcelona, he learned a lot. And then he moved, he made book back to Medellin. And in Medellin, he applied some of the learnings from Barcelona and some of the great things that Manuel that Robert described. Sorry, who do you want to do? I'm keeping up. I'm so flattered. I wish. <laughs> yeah. So, so so he, here's Manuel. This is the guy that we so we went. So this is the author of the project of La Carlota that we were discussing. And uh, Jorge. And and, and, and and this is Beja, what the other author of the project of, of La Carlota. And this guy is Jorge Felix Aramillo, who is also a great guy who built Medellin after studying in several places in the world. So my point is that these were guys who decided to move around to study, to understand what was happening in different parts of the world, and take these, some of these good examples and apply them to their country. So there were a lot of translations. So my, uh, Robert was describing a lot of, uh, of terrible uh, moments where, where, where negative models were uh, reproduced in other countries. Uh, but I want to do a, a different perspective. Sometimes you can have a model that you think that well, it could be reproduced in other models in other countries. And we want to discuss what can happen. So after you're studying a president, what can you need to do in order to, to adapt that, to adapt them uh, in a more positive way in your, into your countries? So we're, 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 I'm, I'm talking about the difference between adopting an idea, the idea that you adopt or, 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 or from, from a president versus adapting the idea. So, which is basically taking the idea and making the transformation to make that, that yours. I am a believer that this is happening every time in architecture. In Studio 6, you're now studying presidents. So I'll, I hope that you can not adopt the ideas that you're learning for your presidents you know, to your project, but to, for adapting them, them to your project. And what we need to understand from this project in order to adapt uh, them. So, but the first, the, the most important thing that these guys were studying, I'm, I'm talking about, about uh, Cacho Cheverri, um, Jorge Perez Jaramillo, Beta, Manuel Delgado, Robert Cowper, is trying to understand what is a public space. So it's basically trying to reimagine the way we design to build not only the private and the build with, with design objects, but the way we also engage with the designing of public spaces. So I need to, to discuss a little bit, to take like three minutes to discuss what is a public space. And in order to discuss that, I will use this huge definition by Joseph Ramoneda. So Joseph Ramoneda, in the middle of this trend of the 
growth of public space in Barcelona and also in Medellin, he decided to investigate these cities and write a, a, a text. Actually, there was it in, in El Pais, it's a new, like New York Times, it's a new paper. What is public space? So he said, and, and I think this is important for us to discuss the importance of public space in urbanism, especially in this class and in Studio 7 later, that public space can be defined by three factors, access, functions, and purpose. So the first one is really easy to understand. We were discussing that a lot two weeks ago. It's access. A public space is public only if every person can access freely to that space without restriction. That is easy. The second one is called is function. And it's basically explaining, please read that in detail, but it's saying that the, the democracy, the more democratic vitality comes when you have a, a good balance between the public and the private. He says that when you have a city where everything is private, you have too much individualism without building collective shared values. But if you have a city where everything is public, like in Venezuela or Nicaragua, you, have, you need to have an auditor and authoritarian regime that imposes this because you are reducing the entrepreneurial capacity of the city. So the public space has to reinforce the both public and private uh, relations. It's saying that a good public space is not only the one that is public and accessible, but also that helps the private area that are around to grow, to, to grow, and to frame and to and to produce economic vitality. And finally, he said that the purpose of a public space it has to be plural, plural, promote diversity. If you have only one single entity, one only one only constituency, like only one right race or one religion in that public space, it's not it's not a public. Space. So moving this, so please. So I have to ask you the 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 Boston drama, is it a public space or not? It is. Uh Penguin Park? It's not, but we can gather there. We build community there. I love being there. But it's public. It's a public space, it's not. So we can have certain areas that we share with the other, we build community, but they are not public. So not public space in the way in the consistent way that, that we can uh, define that. So let's start with Barcelona. So very briefly, so you know, you know Barcelona already, but this is the hometown Barcelona. Sorry that this, the image is a little blurry. So this is the, 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 the Barcelona in the Gothic moment. And so you see that there are a lot of area that were basically farms. And then you have a, a radio that is with almost without villages, and then you have the villages around Barcelona. Do you know what that, that happened? Why this happened? So why in this time, I'm talking about 16th century, Barcelona was basically this town, and this was basically was little, little people living there, and then you have the villages. It's like a radius. You know what? This, I, I want your, your, your speculation. Why did it happen? Why in this moment of the, of the time, this was built, and this was, you have this area without cities, and then you have this area that where cities happen. Do you know why that happened at that, that time? So why you don't have a village here close to Barcelona? Yeah. They were farmland, but, but why you have farmland here and not here? Why you, yes, they were farmland. Why you have these radius where no farm happenings, and you can see that the distance here is almost the same distance here, and almost the same distance here. So why that happens? It's clear that I think it's really curious. So they can be like in a radius of Barcelona south Yeah, but there was a so so there was so uh, remember that this is we're talking about the 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 seventeenth century. Capitalism system didn't work at that moment. So, so why was well, there is a person that they decided not to build their town here? All of this was basically self-produced. Yeah, you raise your hand. But it's somehow. Yeah. 
Yeah, but yeah. But it, it, so remember that we're talking about the media all times. And so say that was very funny in this moment that they, in order to protect this area, they have how they protect with, with canyons. Boom. So this was a decent that, to protect that from bullets. So if these, the bullets come from here, till here. Oh, here's the clue. Yeah, here, yeah, here's the clue that you have. You have here the, the wall. And from here, they, the bullet comes to here, but not to here. So there was empty because of protection. So, but the beautiful thing is that the, in, in, um, in, there was a guy in 1816 called in the field of Fonserda. You already know this. But he, this, he took advantage of this amazing thing to build the famous Barcelona grid. And, and I don't want to go deep in that because I know that you, just, you already studied that in, uh, in the studios in history and theory too. So, but basically it was a system of grids that you have several ways to organize, to create different forms of the spatial relations. And across the time, because this grid allowed the city to boom, so the city um, became really, really, really dense. So the original plan was something like this one, where you have a lot of open areas and a lot of uh, gardens, but suddenly, currently is this area where you have the complete block with the open spaces inside. But the, the message here is how Barcelona built and grew up really fast because of the urban project and because of the economy. In that moment, and this is a very important map for this, because here is when we have the first connection with Medellin. Is that there were a lot of uh, the communities, especially after, after the dictator of Franco passed away, that, that start to ask for the renovation of Project. So instead, of, and it's a, a completely different project. All of them, both of them were great. You have the massive intervention made by the architect, and you have the, ma the massive claim for public space made by the communities in the 60s. Uh, and actually, I, I decided to make to, to evaluate these projects, and you can see here that the amount of project requested by different communities, and 48.5.5% of the of this project was basically cleaned by the community through protests, also through participatory design meetings with the government, where about the needs of new public space because the city was so dense. So this is the map of, of, of the what what's called the urban social movement. It was a strong urban social movement with the government after the after after the after, I say 60s. I'm sorry, this is was the 80s after the dictators pass away, start to ask people what they want, what they want. And the same thing happened in Barcelona, in Medellin. Everything started with Talleres Imaginarios, which is basically Im imagination workshops, where they start to ask people and to engage people about, what do you want? What do you want? What do we want? Start to building a new project. And they started to start building. So each community, different little spaces across the city where they can build new public space, everything is they were scattering. So this, for me, this map is the beginning of the transformation of Barcelona. It's people say, we want more public space. Oh, and after, the, and, and, the, and, and, and the second part was the academia. So you have the community in one side of the, uh, in one part of the, in one side of the community claiming for more, more public space. And in the other side, you have academia and many scholars like Juan Busquets or Oriol Boigas, saying we need to rethink the city, we need to improve the amount of public space, we need to have more public space. And they built uh, several, several documents that help them to reimagine the city in the future. So here there are some data about Barcelona, so, but the most important thing is that there were elections from, because that, that, that's the only thing that happened, I'm sorry. That's the only thing that happened. This claim of new, new public space led by the Academia, happened when the dictator were in power. So while they were in power, they were basically building ideas and reimagining ideas as we are doing now with Caracas, I have to say. So in part in one world, we're now doing, trying to replicate what Barcelona is, what they did in Barcelona in the 70s. Now we have an authoritarian regime in Caracas. The presentation that I showed you last week is something that we're doing in one world, because we know that when, they, when Maduro and the dictators fall down, Wengor will play some very important roles in the re reconstruction of, of, of Venezuela and Caracas. So they, they did the same. They basically started building ideas and, and 
when, when Franco's, the dictators passed away, so there were a new set of mayors and new elections that allows to build two main problems. And I want to explain two theories that came for this problem. One, well, when, when Narcisse Serrat, the mayor of Barcelona between 1979 and 1982, uh, the, there was a director of public services called Oriol Boigas, and he built a concept called urban rehabilitation. That was my, that is the first view, urban rehabilitation. And then between 1982 and 1987, the mayor was Pascual Maragall, and the direct director of public services was Juan Bosquet. And they built a second theory called, called, called urban restructuring. So I will compare now these two theories of urban design that they built for Barcelona, urban rehabilitation versus urban restructuring that were uh, built before the, 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 uh, the democracy happened with several books that you can find then that they, they later published. So the big thing that I'm telling you here that the best way to reimagine the city is think, think in the city. I will say that that Neil Landstrom, they spent nine years training to stay nine minutes in the moon. So, uh, and that same happened here. They spent the whole dictatorship uh, training themselves and publishing and writing books and in order to, to be, be prepared for this moment. So here is the, uh, and, and that is the only task that I have for you today. So I'm going to show you later, many, and you will tell me, because I'm not sure, which of these theories were applied to them. So there are two theories in Barcelona, one by Oriol Boigas and the other one by Joan I want you to say which one was applied to Medellin. The one by Oriol Boigas or the one by Joan Bosque. Let me explain. Basically, you have here the, the description. So basically, Oriol Boigas said with the urban rehabilitation that the city comes from a fragmented piecemeal production of public. You, you produce little things, little things, little things, little things. And you, when you produce little things, because the city is so powerful, the city will build by itself. This is the theory. So you have this little project here, and you have this little project here. Here I hire Felicity, and here I, 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 I hire Ken. Then you do this project, and these will grow and connect by itself because this will be so powerful to rebuild this. That is what Oriol Vegas called urban rebuilding. Regardless of the name, the most important thing for me is to do the thing to understand the logic of the urban. So you will apply also almost every new project next semester. But also because I wanted to explain it or to discover which one was applied in Medellin. The second one is completely different by Joan case. He says that instead of doing micro projects, you do chunk of projects that you design by yourself. Boom. And, and you have this chunk of project and this chunk of project and this chunk of project. And, but they have to be connected by major transportation systems. It's more massive. Obviously, John Busquet was able to do it because there was the Barcelona Olympica, the Olympic Barcelona, where they had a lot of money to rebuild Barcelona in 1992. So remember that he was mayor during the time they were preparing the document for the Barcelona when it was their politics in 1992. So, so he had much more money than Mario Bolivas. So, but the idea is the second, the second, the second theory of urban structure is you have big pieces of urban design connected and major infrastructures of transportation. So, so you can see that the maps of each one represented in some way the way they thought. So the map of Oriol Boigas for Barcelona was little pieces. Actually, in some ways, he was replicating the maps of urban social movement that I showed you before. So if you look at this one, they were the same location of project that we had, sorry, yeah, we had here. So he basically, if people are asking for this project, let's make that happen in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city. And uh, so they have certain areas, so micro projects are were completely scattered. So the scattered intervention of micro projects with the belief, because we really think cities, that, that they were built, will be connected to, to the infrastructure that they already exist. The, the, the plan of Bayon case is more comprehensive. 
you have the whole city and you have big pieces of project that were are connected with major roads of transportation. So this is the type of project that Oriol Boigas did. So he was micro project, amazing one. So you can, you, if you go to Barcelona, you have to visit some of them. There, there are still really, uh, uh, there are still a lot of dynamic here. Sometimes in front of the main station, sometimes the, the, the big museums by the Richard Mayer in, in El Raval, or sometimes new public spaces and parks, but they were scattered around the city and they hired the best architects that you can have to build them. And, and this, uh, and, and, and in the middle, they were also building the traditional uh, zoning map plan. This is the general, the, the Plan General Metropolitano de Barcelona, which is a zoning map trying to divide these fragments, these monofunctional areas. And then Juan Busquets, another genius, I, I, uh, he said, come on, another good guy, it's not a genius, another smart guy. He, he said that the city couldn't be that, like this one, divided just by fragments. So they have to build more. They understand that there are fragments of urban design that has to be redeveloped in order to, under, to create a massive uh, um, uh, uh, reinvigoration of, of, of the public safety. So he decided to divide the city and select 11 specific zones of Barcelona. And each one was what he called a centrality. So that's the second, that's the concept for the urban restructuring. Are you following me? The difference between urban rehabilitation and urban restructuring. The urban restructuring that was getting. These, these big chunks of public space were basically centralities where they say this area could be renovated. This area could be renovated. And each one has like a character. They have one, one sponsor. They have what's a strategic plan. Each one was a competition and, and and all of them were at the end connected by major roads of transportation. So I'm gonna show you here, just for you to understand the logic of this project, one so, few examples. One is, I will, I will start with this one, that is the diagonal Saria. In this diagonal, he decided that this chunk, this peak area of the city could be renovated, like a urban design project. So you, so you can see here is the area that in this particular area, there were some back vacant lots, areas that, it's not, not vacant lots, areas that could be better. And there is a concept here in urban design that is saying it's important. There is the concept of soft, soft infrastructure. So, uh, soft infrastructure is, is the city as let's say soft buildings. Soft buildings are the ones that could be improved to urban design. So, let me give you an example. So if you have if you have a warehouse that is abandoned, it's more it's softer than the hand account. You follow me? Because the warehouse could be much more could be something different. And in real estate is something that, that developers could think of a lot. So this is soft, this work here. So so how we consider in a space that is soft in relation to the city? That is it. So because you can have a house. That is, that has, if you have this house and it's in the middle of an area that can improve the entire city, it's probably softer than other house that, that is not, that in each area doesn't have the possibility to improve. So my point is that you define soft spaces, not only for the infrastructure, but for the capacity that that area has to be improved in relation to that. So they decided that because if this was one of their centrality, these areas are not good, but could be more. Could be more in terms of urban design. And again, I'm in the optimistic side of the session. So this is basically the optimistic view that the city could be better. Right? And they decided to do an urban design project. And the urban design project basically has, imagining that you create new housing projects, a new public space, a new, a new uh, public facility that are connected to a massive urban development, and 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 probably there is an a, 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 a first answer for this question as as probably who's what's that? It was Sean. Who's what? Is it? Don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the the answer that Barcelona did in this time is dividing the micro the mega projects 
into micro projects and assigning that to different constituencies. Sometimes you have one developer here, one community that works here, one and 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 being a manager that where, where everything works together. So the, the big the big difference with this project and the Le Corbusier big projects is that instead of designing everything by one architect, they created they created the framework and they assigned or start to open the market and to open different peoples to start building that step by step. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you think it is or, or it's not? Uh, yeah, so in, in the case of Medellin, I will put an example about why doing a mega project could be also harmful for the for the for the city. Remember that like so, but in this case, yes, you have to believe in the energies and the capacity of the city to build themselves, to build itself. You have to believe that you are doing the framework. And this area needs or wants redevelopment, not redevelopment, reimagined, it needs to be reimagined. And you believe that something will happen with the market. That you have to, in this case, you have to play in favor of the market, but by regulating the market and but allowing the market to grow as well. You have to build, you have to play with, with the with the freedom of the market. Yeah. So and this is what I see, what I decided here is to take a picture. Of the same area, what is how it looks like today in 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 Google Earth. So these are the area that were renovated. This is a very recent image that I, that it that it took from Google Earth. So the beauty of this part is you see that it's difficult to recognize what is new, what is old. So this was part of the project, for example, and then the way they decided to fragment this in different parcels tries to replicate the energy that we're having here. So there are a lot of connection between the things that are happening around and the things that are happening in the new project. It's basically a piecemeal intervention where you create a big project as a centrality, but you ask different stakeholders to develop different fragments. And you have also this huge part like this one, like a big project. So in this case, you have the, the, the so basically they divided this big plot that works basically a, and antique warehouses to different parcels and put that in the market. You have different developers doing that, but consistently to work as a, as a uh, to work uh, together. So now it's difficult to understand what is new and what is old. And what is very important is they allow them to build their housing through the new parcels, but also they ask them, each person to contribute to the design of this, what is now called complete street. A complete street is a street that has everything together. You have huge sidewalk, uh, transportation, a little space for for, for mobility bikes, uh, another way to transportation, a big sidewalk as well. So this and a lot of, of, of landscape and vegetation and greenery are, are animated the area. So when you redesign the area, you also design the public, and the public is designed by the city, but the private is designed by the developers and to try to create rules to, to, for them to work together. But also sometimes you have huge pieces of work, of project. This is by Rafael Monet, the one that is in green right there. And he had, he was commissioned to have this big project. And the beauty of this big project is that's, that the, he decided to integrate certain of the, certain, uh, 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 um, pedestrian route of the of, of, of the context of the fabric and integrate that in with, with, within the city. Um, so and, and in some way the project is fragmented in order to replicate the fragmentation of the city, but in a different way in, in, in a more in, in a massive way. Then let's talk about the second example that I think is even more interesting. It's the same logic that will be repeated and repeated. So this is basically an area that because have a lot of connections in transportation could be redeveloped or reimagined. And you can reimagine that to improve public space, but at the same time to allow uh, different uh, uh, constituencies, also real estate to do their work as well. So in this case, also really connected to the public transportation system. It's a set of open area that the, uh, these two parts that were a little disconnected with one area that could be reimagined from the connection of these two spaces. 
And, 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 and for me, the most interesting thing is that this project, for example, was developed in the Oreo Bojigas area. So Oreo Bojigas included this park in one of his rehabilitation projects. But Guapo Skates, five years later, he decided to integrate that into his project. It's, they were not thinking these two concepts as something that is that are in battle or a continuation of the of the uh, of, of a progress where one thing moves towards the other. So how you can build the project in the city in as a long term and trying to take advantage of the previous area to build something new. So here, so they built some models. So basically, the logic here is that because you have this huge piece of transport, and also this there is another thing that is important is. The, 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 the importance of density. Densification could be a good thing as well. Actually, you say that the first slide. Right? Yeah. So densification could be a good thing because instead of people living by the city, you can people living inside. Next week, we'll talk about infrastructure zoning and how you can have densification as a tool to also to improve affordable housing. So what you're, what you're seeing here is why not it makes sense, and this is a design decision. So you have this, this part and this uh, corridor, and because you have this corridor, you can change the zoning of these areas in front of the corridor to increase the, the density. And then you have certain this area that is low density or uh, at the scale of the neighborhood inside, but you have you can redensify this area in front of the area, and, and you know what happens when you redensify. You have you have a tool to ask developer give me one. So basically, you could say to developers, I will give you the opportunity that instead of having five floors, you can have 50. And in the urban plan, it works. But in a change, you have to remake this, this urban corridor or you have to fix the urban plan that is inside. So you can make this exchange with the, with the developer, the tool, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the city, you say, I'm giving you the opportunity to make a lot of money. Give me a part of this money, but I this money to fix or to remain part of the urban plan. Yeah. By intensifying, do you mean just building up higher? And this is one way to intensify. You can also grow in this area. But that's where this stuff about putting more square feet in the building, increasing the amount of square feet. In this case, the way it was basically having this building higher. But you can already do three days by different models. Like reducing steps and back. So yeah, but we're talking about increasing the square feet inside the city. So that space between the towers and the corridor is that road? This, this, all, all this black building. Yeah. No, but the empty space between the black buildings and the trees. This yeah, one? How is that used? Oh, let me show you. That's a good question. Let me show you. So basically, what they say is you can grow a lot, but, um, and you can see some of how this is today, but in, but, but only if you build this street for me in front of me. This is how it works. If you see that street, it's a complete street again. Uh, let me go back. Where you have, which is not symmetrical. That's the beauty. You have a long sidewalk here with a lot of trees. It's like a park in, inside of the uh, 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 as a street where you have a lot of kiosks and, and, and many uh, retails uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the first in the ground floor of the building open into this area. And then you have area that are exclusive for, for cabs, buses, buses, uh, new trees, two lines, lines of cars, and another side of it. So you can redesign the public space and, and you can, and, and basically they say to developers, you can grow, you can increase, you, I, will, I will give you the opportunity to increase your, your, um, uh, you're building for certain numbers of floors, so you will have you will have a lot of money, but you will give me part of the money to build that thing, and you negotiate that in advance. So I build that, and because that increases the value of your of your land, you will support me to, and you will give me the money to 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 this to this land. So, and 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 then last one, I don't know if it's the last one, uh, but I have to rush. So it's an area that was in front of the of the water that used to be an industrial area. And, and they decided to redevelop that into a new urban grid that it was called uh, the, the Olympic Village. And that is funny here because that competition was won by Boreal Boigas. So they were in competition as an urbanist 
But when 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 your Rumbus can develop this idea, or you always won the competition. I think this is this is his project. He's basically, and this is the project today. And this is, in my opinion, this fragment of Barcelona is like a so is it's a, it's, a, it's a lector of, of building typology. It's a lector. All, this phrase itself is a lector of building typology. The logic was really simple. It's basically trying to open with the grid and with the new infrastructure, the city towards the sea, opening the city towards the sea, towards the water. And, and, and there are several beautiful interventions, like the, this, this beautiful, amazing canopy by Frank Gehry on these towers of the, or, the, or the new beach here. But for me, what I'm trying to show you today is, is the amount of thousands of building typologies that you can have, it could, you can have diversity. So sometimes you have like a big corridor with little um, uh, townhouses, then, sorry, freestanding these houses in the center, or sometimes you have townhouses, and sometimes you have villas inside, but you can have a diverse typology of, of housing there, but they are all, you can see some of the here, but they are all connected, or working together by the public space, by the fabric. So you have a, a, this diversity of public space, but everything is connected, sorry, this diversity of typology, but everything is connected by the continuity of these urban fabrics that they created, especially by a diverse amount of them. So Barcelona is being a, um, a, a laboratory of public space, and I don't want to stop here for a while, but currently this is what now, what now it's happening right now in Barcelona, is the idea of the soccer block. Imagine that the old grid, that you have a lot of transportation, a lot of cars, you reduce the cars only for, for the exterior of three by three blocks, and you reduce the interior only for designated cars, like residents or like um, uh, police or, 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 or delivery, thank you, or also public transportation, giving more spaces to project like this one. So they are transforming street into new public spaces with tactical urbanism and other strategies. So I'm gonna move now to the team. And again, I need you, please, to tell me if you recognize something that's happening in Medellin in, in Barcelona that was applied to Medellin. Because what, what was true is that this guy, Cacho Chevere again, was hired by the Alcalde Sergio Fajardo that he described before. And he was working in Barcelona. So that guy was working in Barcelona. He was teaching in the in the same university at San but with John Busquet. And he and 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 Sergio Fajardo said, Come to here. I need you to work with me to rebuild Mark Medellin. And he decided, let me apply the thing that I learned in Barcelona, but in Medellin. So so the first thing that I can recognize here, so the, the question that I have to you is I want to understand if, if Medellin is more over restructuring or over <laughs> Rehabilitation. This is something that I want you to tell me in five minutes. So, so he they they decided in a branch that is the, the the most educated city, and and there was also a big a huge history of or of, of of participatory design and, and in, in, in in Medellin, which is similar that in Barcelona. These are small projects that were built in in in, in Medellin during the nineties work uh, on small projects like the city, so they didn't come. Like, I was saying, uh, Robert, that one of the things that I like of this guy and the history of Medellin is that there are no heroes here. So there are basically people who are trying to understand what is happening and to adapt some ideas that I were seeing everywhere to, in order to rebuild the city. So, and, and, and this is a proof of that. This is a map that, that Jorge Pérez Jaramillo gave me this week, where you have all the whole city and the amount of public competition, public say that have happened between 1989 until the construction of 2014. So progressively, they were doing competitions and competition, asking public spaces to build, sorry, asking architects to build new public spaces. One of the best ones was this project. I want you to understand if this is over replication or, 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 or over restore. okay? And this is my question for you. Again, urban rehabilitation is you do piecemeal projects and you believe that they will be connected. Urban restructuring, you have a centrality, 
connected to major form, uh, uh, um, uh, forms of transportation. So here, everything started with a cable car. So the cable car, when, when Sergio Fajardo came to the main city, the cable car was in project, but just the car, just the cable car. What they decided to understand that every time that you put a pole of the cable car, you have an opportunity to do a new project because you have to remove things. So why not combining the structure of the city with the infrastructure of the transportation? Because the infrastructure by itself, it doesn't build the city. It builds when you connect that with the structure. Actually, I have to tell about my experience. When you go to Medellin, the cable car is nice. Yes, it's beautiful. You can see everything. But the most beautiful part is that you walk around and you see that the little streets are connected with the lake of Celsius Empanadas. Because if you're there and it's a group, build a new, a new newspaper with a new cultural center, and you see the houses. Everything is like connected by the minor structure of the streets that that part of the self-produced environment has. And the infrastructure was basically an opportunity to do that. So they use the infrastructure of the cable car as an opportunity to build the structure, the structure and the building and the street networks of the city. And so basically the, they start building these thousands of public spaces inside the self-produced environment. So sometimes, so here, look at this. So here is where you have the cable car. But inside the cable car, you have, for example, this transformation of this river into new public spaces and public pools for the kids. Or sometimes you have this street and this street was transformed into, into this new street and with the system of public spaces that are connected to go from one cable car station towards the other. My point is that the most of the advertised things in Barcelona, in Medellin, is the cable car. But for me, the big, big transformation happened at that level, at the level of the street where, where people live. Yeah, this was very important. We're analyzing this. Uh, and this is an amazing project, one of these library parks. And this is how this library park looks today. It failed as, an, as a building, but the city is still there. These connections are still there. Even if this project as a single unit world, uh, see if, if there is one single message that I can give you in this lecture is, is the arch architecture is important, yes but only if that helps you to build the structure that the city needs, only if it is connected to the system that the city asks you to build. So, so because this building at the end have this strategy, the famous, the famous Guggenheim strategy. You know what is the Guggenheim effect? That the idea of, do you know what is it? The Guggenheim effect? It's a very well known strategy in architecture. You know, do you know this building by Frank Gehry? The Guggenheim effect says that if you put these amazing buildings, like an architect doing very fancy buildings, the city will uh, 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 re-emerge. I will, I will be better. But no, what nobody tells about, about the Guggenheim effect is that this case succeeds in Guggenheim, not because of this building, but because of this infrastructure. So the building was there, it's amazing. The Guggenheim by Frank Gehry is an amazing building. That building is really amazing. But they also uh, renovate the river. They also create a new system of public transportation. They also create an agreement with the all people of all restaurants and they create training process to accept more tourism. Tourist. And now you can go there to eat the best food that you can eat in Spain. And this is part of the plan. The food in the world. In San Sebastian, just got started. Just got started. It's the best food in the world. So that was part of the plan. So what I'm, what I'm inviting you to think is that the architecture is important. Yes. But, all, all, but only if this is connected with the, with the landscape, with the infrastructure, and with the people. If you connect this with these things, you can create a synergy to create the real Bilbao effect because most of these projects have failed because they were only a building. And so, and you can see one of this, this, this is my picture. What, this is great, but what is amazing is this. What is amazing is they have to put this pole to create this cable car, but they build this little playground and this moment where you can come from here, go down from the stakers, connect here and continue moving around. So the city, this infrastructure as an opportunity to create a structural 
connection. So this, this study continues today. They are currently doing a renovation of a river. This is something to tell you that they are still building strategies. And I will come with this one next week about when you talk, when we talk about inclusionary housing. And they are basically the project that is ongoing right now, transforming the river of Medellin into a new proposal. So my question for you, we have five minutes to talk. Okay. Do you think Medellin was over restructuring? They say the first slide that is up here is Robert, uh, sorry, Cacho Chevrolet say we will apply Barcelona into Medellin. And they did. They did not apply, they adopted, they adopted Barcelona to Medellin. Can you tell me why how you compare this? That was over restructuring or over or uh, over rehabilitation. When you understand how the country is now, I think they use them both Yeah, brilliant. That's it. That's exactly what happened. So they were so the, these guys understood this strategy. So they, what is happening? What other tools of adaptation they have from Barcelona to Medellin? Again, we're same thing where we're not the same thing. Some of the guys work in Barcelona and moved to Medellin to start working. What else? So I, I can tell you another one. Community connection with the people. So we have the urban social movement in Barcelona. And then this is something that I didn't realize until I talked with, with Asher Chevere, but it's something that is not evident for the plan. plan. They say, we understood that the urban social movement after uh, um, um, created the platform, the energy for people to ask for public space. We, dis we decided to start with studies, imaginarios, imaginary workshops, and asking people what they want. That was the first action that they did. It was pretty similar at the end. What else they did? They use infrastructure to create power power centrality, but also use micro interventions that were connected by the energy. They believe in the as a tool. That is not my country, my what else happened? What are the connections you can see between Barcelona and Medellin? Yeah. They decide transportation. They look at cable car and then the, the transportation came first, but, true. but at the same time, there was infrastructure as, as, as an excuse in both cases. Infrastructure as an excuse to build structure. And when it's a structure, in this case, I refer to urban networks, to street networks. So, how the infrastructure is a tool to do a street network. So, currently, the one nation that we have in the world that is a, that is a problem, the money is very short. We only have, we don't never have. So where we're, what these guys were trying to do is that if you have money and you have an intervention, you try to do everything that you can do in that intervention. You do infrastructure for public space, or infrastructure, but uh, city brand, but community participation. So what I so did, what, what we try to do today, and I'm you know, I'm trying to wrap up right now is that we can. Uh, um, have models that will be reproduced or replicated in other cities. That happens every time. We study theaters and presidents and understand how to be applied to other cities. But I remember when I studied architecture, uh, 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 a lecture from a guy from Harvard, they were studying architecture as well, and they asked us to implement, to implant or implement Paris into Caracas or Rio de Janeiro to Caracas. The same as that I, what's a trend in the, in the oh, area? Yeah. What's a trend in the area? But they never understood that there should be certain adaptations. So the, the point of the message here is that you can have certain models that you can replicate or reproduce, but it's not the same to adopt them and to adapt them to your specific, to the specific cultural um, uh, uh, implications of, or characteristics of these of the city that are receiving. So opening of adapting the the models to the cultures of, of this particular space is probably the tools to make this adaptation or this transformation that in order to have positive that's it. That's it. Okay, see so you we're using the sign sheet to do attendance so if you're not on here, please uh, 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.